Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a special guest. We have Rebecca Moore here with us. Rebecca, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Darren. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how I know Rebecca. So both Rebecca and I are in the same mentor, multifamily mentorship program. We kind of run in the same crowd. Um, but we recently just met up at a uh, multifamily meetup You know that we had at a restaurant with some, some friends of ours. Uh, Dustin Miles and Hayden Harrington put, on, put that on. And we just had a t- you know a chance to catch up, and she was showing me pictures of one of her properties, and it, it looks great, and and we just were having a good time. And I said, well, why don't we why don't we do a podcast together? And she was like, let's do it. So um, appreciate you coming on. Um, typically, first question I ask is how many properties and how many units are you currently invested in? Yes, over ten properties, uh, t- two thousand thirty eight doors. Three of those properties we have sponsored ourselves. Uh, that total 350 doors. Fantastic. So over 2,000 doors, three of three properties for like 300 plus as, as a GP. Correct. And, uh-huh. and um, you know, a few, few interesting things that we want to delve in here. Uh, one is, look, you, you live in California. Um, you just recently moved to Dallas, but like you bought properties in Texas from California. So I'd be interested in hearing from you, you know, how one, why didn't you buy in California? Why'd you buy in Texas? And two, you know, what was that process like, you know, not being in your backyard? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, we did not buy in California because California, that market is quite expensive as most people know and so you're really buying on appreciation and you have it has very very low cap rates so there's not a good cash flow so syndication is a lot tougher because you can't give your investors back a lot of money it's more on the sell so that's where Texas is great in the sense that you have that cash flow so that's where we were able to come out here and do uh, the syndication also, as you mentioned, our mentoring group is centered in Texas, and so that's where I got my education and met all sorts of people in order to learn this business. And so there's a lot of investors that you met that have interest in, in Texas properties too, so part of your network um, building happened in Texas. Yes. But now you're, you're in California, you know, I'm, I want to delve in this a little bit because, you know, there's listeners that are maybe they're in the Northeast, maybe they're in, in different markets where they they really don't understand how can I take advantage of going into these other markets? I know that these other markets are, are higher growth markets and maybe better, but how do I do it? You know, so how do you build the relationships with um, investors? How do you build relationships with brokers? How do you find partners? All of that, you know, if you don't live in the state that you're looking to purchase in. Yeah, so uh, again, I was lucky enough to be part of a group that is centered in Texas. And so that's where I found my partner. And together, we would look at properties and he would tell me about the geographical area let's look in this area, stay away from that area. So he was really key for me to be able to learn the area on the map without being there on the ground. However, I would come out to Texas at least six times a year. So you can think about it as every other month. I would be out here and stay, let's say, a good four days, learning the terrain, going to events, Um, here in Texas. So learning about any mentorship program that has events here in Texas, and I'll say Dallas specifically was my, is my terrain, uh, 
going there, that's where you're meeting your investors, you're meeting other syndicators, so that you can learn um, who's in the business, what the business is about in the Texas area for me. So what, whichever state you wanna do, you need to be there at events and meeting those people because a lot of times investors want to be able to touch and see the product that they are investing in. Um, it takes a very sophisticated investor to invest outside to a different state. That's at least that's what I've found myself. So sure. being there, being with your partner, taking the extra time to drive the properties, everything that was on sale, I would drive by, even if it was uh, something way out of my range or way uh, lower, meaning that if it was something that needed a heavy lift, I didn't care because I wanted to see the property, I wanted to understand it. So I would take the time each time I came out to Texas to learn the terrain. So that is really important. Also, another tip for learning the area outside of your state Absolutely. is getting to know the brokers. Taking them for a cup of coffee or setting up a tour if you are serious about uh, putting an LOI on a property, that's very important too, so they can put a face to the name and so that they can see that you're serious. And you, you brought up a lot of di different good, great points. Um, one is, you know, if you're going after your first deal, you really need to partner with somebody that has experience or you're not gonna win a deal um, in, mm -hmm. in today's competitive market. So you have to surround yourself with other people that have significant experience. And how do you do that? You know, one way is to join a mentorship group like we did. Um, another way is to go to um, multifamily type meetup groups in, in the air, in the market that you wanna buy in. Um, you know, there you can start by using Facebook groups, um, you know, Facebook, multifamily Facebook groups and to, to try to meet people um, that way, but that's critical is to align yourself with a partner that has experience. Um, and on that note, you know, I get this question a lot, so I want you, I want you to answer it. Is you know, if you're new, why would somebody that has experience want to partner with you as a new person? Yes, I. That's great. Number one, there's a number of things, but number one, I would say a lot of times an experienced uh, person might not have the time or want to underwrite a deal. So if you're out of state, yet you're underwriting a deal in your targeted market, you can be t showing the numbers to that more experienced person. Hey, this one looks like it might be good. If you are taking the time to call the insurance company, to call the tax person, to get all the minute details that that experienced sponsor might not have the time to put in, that's a value to that sponsor. Absolutely. Of course, it, yeah, if you have your own wealth and liquidity, that's a big help sometimes too when you're trying to take down larger buildings. So that's two places where you can help. Also, the last one is fundraising. If you have a large network of people who are interested in multifamily investing, then you might be able to help that syndicator with fundraising. So those are three different ways that those are those are all great person. points. But I, you know, I think that some people when they're when they're thinking about possibly getting in, actually, I, I, I was talking to a young guy this morning, like 26 years old, and he's like, why would anybody want to, you know, experience want to work with me? And part of it is just mindset, right? So you think that other people aren't going to want to work with you. But then when you get to surround yourself with other people, that's what the benefit of going out into a mentorship group or into meetup groups as you talk to other people, how'd you do it? You realize that just like you said, there are experienced syndicators that, you know, maybe they're focused on 200 unit plus deals or 300 plus unit plus deals, or they, you know, they're only focused in a certain segment and 
you can go and, and do something and do all the work and then just present them with a deal and they look it over and they have experience and they're like, that's a good deal and you've done all the work. That's value. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's worth partnering with somebody on. Um, yeah, so, it takes hours sometimes to yeah, get all that information together that a, an experienced person might not have. You know, in my, my experience, it could t- you know, it's much more than hours because the underwriting is one piece, but then, you know, contacting the property management company and getting a budget and including that and getting, a, you know, other people to review your underwriting and then going and visiting properties, surrounding properties in the area. and Right, all, doing a market survey. Yeah, talking to mm-hmm. insurance companies and, and lenders. I mean, there's just so much work that can be done ahead of time to save that experienced person. So you're, you know, you, you marry up, you, you do all the legwork, they've got the balance sheet and the experience, and now you've got a good team. So that that's great. Um, another thing you, t- you said was, you know, when you're in the area, you don't care if, even if it's a deal that you're not gonna pursue, you, you're, gonna, you're going out to all of the deals, as many deals as you can that are for sale to look because you learn and you you know when you do that you learn and you compare and that is a process that I think everybody has to go through you know and you learn on every every time you walk a property right Um, so talk about some of the maybe lessons you learned from going on property tours and talking to brokers and um, just looking at different areas, you know, what were some of the lessons that you've learned from doing that? Yeah, great. Um, one thing is that in not living in Texas at that time, by driving by at least all all the multifamily that was on sale, I could really learn the terrain. I could really learn what's a sketchy neighborhood, what's the absolute greatest neighborhood that I'd love to be able to buy in. Also, getting to know the words, basically, that the brokers will use to <laughs> right, lingo, describe right? a property. Right, right. Uh, you know, basically, does this one have a lot of hair on it or not? Right. <laughs> yes. So, um, learning what a stab lock or what a Federal Pacific um, panel is, that's the, uh, these are the basic things that you need to know about let's say insurance and so by going on tours that's very uh, useful also just thinking about flood zones um, that is very useful to see the elevation of the property that you're at even though you uh, might not know the elevation let's say by viewing it You can get an idea. So for example, on one property tour I went to, I knew the place was in a flood zone. And when I looked over the balcony at at one of these places, there was complete erosion right on the side of the building. And I immediately said, nope, guess I won't be putting in an offer on this one because I knew it would be amazing, you know, insurance. So those are very, very pivotal uh, important things that you need to see by going on a property tour or at least even driving by. You can yeah, absolutely you can, and, and just you layer that knowledge on each you know each deal that you walk on that you look at you learn something new you learn new lingo. Um, mm-hmm. I know when I was doing property tours with with brokers you know one of the questions I would always ask is you know where do you see the value and where do you see yes. the upside and being new to the industry, you know, these brokers, they're doing this every day. And they also hear the comments from new people and also experienced people. And what questions do they ask and where, so they may have just done a property tour at the same property with somebody that has a lot of experience. And that investor said, here's where I see the value. And then the broker just reiterated it to you. And now all of a sudden you learn something new, you know? Yes, yes. Um, one, on one deal, I remember I asked that question and the broker said, you know what, there's there's this empty unit over here that they're using for whatever. I would take that out and put, you know, put the stuff out in, in someplace else and I'd 
make that a revenue unit. And and I thought to myself, well, not only did I learn for that deal, but every property visit I go on from that point on, I'm looking for empty buildings or empty units or um, other ways to increase income, you know, with, with more space. So that's huge um, learning from doing going on it. The other thing, and I don't know if you experienced this or not, but I remember going to in early stages, going to a few properties and I'm like, I wouldn't want to live there. And so I was like, I'm going to pass on this deal. Uh huh. <laughs> and then I remember all of a sudden at one point, like six months later, I passed this property and I'm like, Oh, that's a nice property. And I'm like, that's the same property that I passed on six months earlier because I was thinking about it from a standpoint of, Hey, I wouldn't want to live there for, because it was, it was right next to a train tracks. It was right next to, um, an auto body shop. And, but the reality is, you know, if you can improve that property, you know, nice, nicer paint, nicer upgrades on the interior. And you look at the numbers and you're providing, you know, good value to the tenants and you, the numbers work such that you can get good returns for your investors. That's a different way to look at it. Not do I want that's to what matters. Yeah. Right. Because in many cases, we don't want to live there. And we have been able, luckily, to not live in C-class or even sometimes B-class apartments now. So it's wonderful to be able to give these people a nicer place to live. That's right. the goal. Absolutely. That is the goal. Improving and sometimes, the unfortunately, they do have to live in places that are near the train tracks. And they might have a lower rent than one that's not, but we still want to make it a great place for them to live. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so what about being a woman in the business? Like what did you have any hurdles that you had to go through or was it any different? Did you have, did it feel like it was tougher to build credibility? Um, talk to me about that because there, I would say I, I see more and more women getting into the business, um, but it's you're, you know it's still a minority. Yeah, I think I go right to mindset on that. If I don't make it a, a barrier in my mind, then I have already overcome it. Luckily, I also have other mentors, women in the business that have led the way for me. Uh, but I don't make it a barrier for myself. So I think that is that is about all I can bring to the table on that, that I don't, that's, I choose that's perfect, not though. You know, yeah, to mindset make it a Mindset is such a big thing, I think, in this business. You know, being a woman could be another negative thought in your head, but you mm -hmm. choose not to have that be, you know, a negative thought in your head. So it's a non-issue. Um, you know, a lot of people think that they have to start with single family and then they have to go to a duplex and then a fourplex mm -hmm. and an eightplex. And that's mindset, you know, like that's where their, their head believes that that's all they can achieve at that time. But, you know, when you surround yourself with other people that have done it, then you realize, you know what, I can go bigger. I can do this. You know, mm -hmm. you said other women paved the way you just look at like, Hey, these other women, they've done it. Why not me? Right, and so if there is um, any kind of bias, it'll be on the other person. Sure. And that's where they need to grow. Absolutely. So when we met up at that meetup, um, you were showing me some pictures and I was really impressed with what you guys have done on the rehab. Um, so some of these older properties, you know, maybe 60s, 70s, um, some of them have like, what do you call it? The, sh the shingles on the side of the mansard the roofs, mansard roofs. So it's like mm -hmm. flat on the top. And then they have these shingles that come along the front part of the building. Yes. And halfway down the building. It looks like the roof comes down. Yeah. And it really dates the property, you know? So if you see that, 
it just looks older. It looks, you know, um, but you guys tore that off and you put on hardy board siding and mm-hmm. holy cow, it, it like made the property look so, so talk about how'd you make, even make that decision? How'd you even know to do that? Oh, that's a great story. So, um, I do quite a bit. Well, I do the underwriting here in the family and my husband, Warren, uh, he executes most of the asset management. So when I underwrote our, our deal, I had, of course, we did our due diligence and our guy told us, don't worry about the roofs. We can patch them. We can, you know, put tape on it. It'll be fine. You know, you don't, (laughs) you don't need to, you don't need to redo the roofs. It'll be fine. So I underwrote like that. I put, I did put in a minor budget for it, but I said, oh, roofs, just stay as you are, please. Well, Warren being the captain of many ships uh, said, Absolutely not. Because well, your is husband, not Warren, is a Navy guy, right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, he sure is. And so everything has to be ship shape and have safety for all. Um, not that a roof would not have safety, but he likes it to be perfect. Uh, so he sees the roofs after we already purchased the building and says, no way, we've got to figure out how to put on new roofs. So what he did is he spoke to the lender. We got a green program and they wanted us to put in new windows. Warren was able to discuss with the lender to say, let's just do new roofs. That's going to make it much more energy efficient. Let us put that money toward the roofs. So it was wonderful. We found a contractor that then took off the ugly asphalt mansards and we were able to put in hardy plank, which can be painted to any color you would like. We hired a designer to uh, get the colors that would match and look great. So she gave us a spectrum of seven seven different uh, color schemes. So we picked the color scheme had the hardy plank put on and brand new paint throughout the whole place. And it looks fabulous now. It went from this ugly 1967 tired looking building to looking brand new and the tenants are pleased. And I really think it's going to drive uh, the the rents up for sure. And uh, maybe the sale price as well, because I think it's a much more attractive building. But it was really great that we could take those funds that were going to go elsewhere from the lender and put it into the new roofs to make the place really shine. That's an awesome story. So I, I didn't know the backstory on that. And, um, I think that that's very interesting that, so you budgeted that you were going to replace the windows. The lenders thought you were going to replace the windows for the green program. And after the fact, you guys go back and say, Hey, look, it makes more sense to do this. You know, are you okay with that? And the lender thinks about it and they come back and say, yeah, that makes sense. Go for it. And it's a win, win, win. It's a win for you. It's a win for the lender and it's a win for the tenants. And I saw pictures and it modernized that property so much. It looks great. And so, uh, you know, hats off to both you and Warren for, for taking that action. Yeah, it was really fun, actually. And I think the tenants are so pleased. We've gotten a really great response. You know, they it's more of that pride of their own ownership in living there, that they live in a beautiful place. Yeah, absolutely. And it also, you know, they're happy that they're living in a nicer community. Um, and it's got to reflect on the ownership team, too. Like, hey, they're, they're, they care about us. You know, yeah. they're they're investing in our property and making it look nicer for us. Um, so I didn't know your background until you sent me some background info, but you're, you're in psychology. Is that correct? That's correct. I am a clinical psychologist. So do you, are you still practicing? I am. I have just a handful of patients that I see online now, virtually they're My patients are all in California, but I see them still while I'm living here in uh, Dallas. Fantastic. So I'm I'm like, when I saw that, I'm like, all right, she's going to be like analyzing everything I do during this interview. (laughs) The first one that I've interviewed is a psychologist. So um, 
You moved from California to Dallas just recently. Why did you do that? It has been a, a thought in the making for years. Uh, Warren was a, or is a Texas resident. He had a beach house down in Port Aransas while he was stationed uh, there at Corpus Christi Ingleside. So he's been telling me, let's go to Texas, let's go to Texas. <laughs> but much more so has been our business and all of the friends that we have made through our, you know, through our group. Sure. It's been that pull to come here to Dallas. So when we got our third syndication, I thought, or both of us thought, well, I, I guess it's time to be closer that Warren really wanted to be more hands-on uh, on the properties as well. And of course, we can't deny that uh, a better cost of living, great politics, less taxes. So it's all in the making. A yeah, lot of so the reasons finds- why a lot of companies are moving from California to Texas and a lot of residents are moving. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm originally an East Coast guy and mm-hmm. I think the cost of living here is fantastic. I've been in the Dallas area for about 11 years, and cost of living is fantastic. It's clean, um, great workforce. Um, Like you said, it's it's, uh, business friendly, and so there's a lot of good things about um, being in Texas for sure. And and with COVID, a lot more people have been moving into Texas um, in all the major metropolitan markets in Texas. So... um, Talk about, you know, you said you did your third syndication, you know, uh, talk about the first time that you actually had to raise capital for that deal. Did, you know, were you scared? Were you fearful? Like, how'd you overcome that? Like that, the, you know, syndications, when I talk to people that haven't done it, that's one of the things that they're really uptight about is, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could raise the money. Understood. Yes, it, it can be a nail biter for sure. Now, for myself, again, being part of our group, that ecosystem helps tremendously. And being a part of it, showing up, you got to show up, you have to have your face in front of everybody to that they know you and trust you and might want to invest with you uh, is very key. Is it scary still? Yes, it is. Right. Uh, That is also um, the fundraising part to be able to share with more people is one of the reasons why we started Starboard Equity. And so we got ourselves to the website and we want to be able to reach more people who can benefit from the amazing returns that a syndication can bring. But yeah, luckily for me, uh, going back to our first syndication, I had a very well-known partner, and so he was a big help, but I was thrilled to be able to pull my weight, and uh, that was true with the second and third as well. But it's, it is, for me, I gotta say, it's still always a nail biter. Yeah, you know, it, but you said a lot of things there. One is, um... Look, when you're going through these large scale multifamily things, there's a lot of steps and you, you know, you can't really look at all the steps and get overwhelmed by it. You just have to kind of do the next step. And Mm -hmm. so when you get to, oh, oh, holy cow, we're we're in contract, you know, now you've already done all, all these other steps. You've gotten past that and now you're in contract on your first deal, you know, one, it, you have the comfort that you're partnered with somebody that has experience. So they're like, look, the numbers are good. The property is good. The returns are going to be good, you know, um, and we're going to raise the money. You know, it's nice having a partner that's going to be there to help you along the way, but then you just figure it out, right? You go out to the relationships that you've been building for the last, you know, year or two and, and, um, you know, telling people and, and then have them jump on board. So you, you mentioned that you just started a new website. Um, I think you said it was starboard 
equity.com. Did you just you just launch that recently? Yes, we sure did. Yes, uh, Starbird so, Equity. We went with Starbird because, sort of going back to Warren's uh, background as a naval officer, uh, the Starbird ship has the privilege. Uh, it has the right of way if two ships are uh, coming toward each other. So because it's the lead ship, it has the right of way, it's the privileged ship. You know, we think about the Starbird Equity as showing people the right way to invest. We can take the lead and help you to get to where you want to be financially in the investment scheme. So that's why we chose that name and uh, got a great website that we think is going to be very helpful for those uh, who want to invest. Because when I think about my first syndication, actually that uh, right now, it, the returns are going to be phenomenal if and when we should sell. And I actually feel bad that I didn't tell more people about right. it at that time as a first time syndicator. Because, you know, we sort of think, oh gosh, this is my first time, right? I, I My partner knows what they're doing, but this is my first, so I won't tell everybody. That's That, that wasn't a good idea. I should have told everybody I knew because I it, think that's so, such such a great return. I'm glad you said that, and I'm, I want listeners to hear that because, you know, it's not about getting people's money; it's about presenting an opportunity. And, Huge opportunity. You know, who, who are we? You know, the the syndicator to decide whether they want to pursue that opportunity or not. You know, let's put it in front of them, and if they they want to then fantastic and if they don't mm -hmm. no worries we go on to the next person but sometimes i think in our head we're like oh that person there's no way they'll invest well how can we make that decision you know yeah pr present it the opportunity to them and and then let them make the decision mm -hmm. and um yeah so my wife said hey d you know i don't know if we should go to if you should go to um friends and family on the first syndication kind of like what you're saying like oh i don't know if i should bring it to everybody and i'm like i'm not wired that way i believe it's a good it's a great deal we're investing money in the deal and if they don't have interest they don't have interest but and i and i was really surprised because there were certain people that i thought were no-brainers that they would invest mm -hmm. uh -huh. and maybe and they they were wealthy they had multiple businesses they were an entrepreneur but they're like, hey, Darren, man, I just put a bunch of capital in my business. I just don't have the capital right now. The timing's not right. And then there were other people that I'm like, oh, this person, there's no way they'll invest. And I, I say, well, let me just reach out. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, can we get together for coffee? Can we figure, like, how does this thing work? What are the risks? Mm -hmm. What are the returns? Mm -hmm. and, and then they invested. I'm like, that's, it's, it's a really weird dynamic. So I, I love that you said that you wish you told more people, and if you had to do it over again, you would tell everybody. Yes. I, mm -hmm. I firmly believe that. The other thing that I, I think that um, listeners should pay attention to is that, you know, you had a team, right? You had an experienced syndicator who has done that. You had third-party property management. You had a lender who gave you you know, has been yes. doing these types of loans forever. And mm -hmm. they all were saying it's a good deal, you know? So it's just the mindset of the first person, you know, the yes. first time person that kind of gets in the way sometimes. Yes. It is so critical to have your mind in the right place and lessons learned you know, right. for myself. And like you might be, this might've been the first time at that time but for new people to recognize and be listening to podcasts such as this so that they can get their mindset uh, at the right place. Absolutely. And, and the, mm -hmm. another thing is, I think some people think that syndicators, they all, that's all they do is they, they syndicate and you know bring in other people into the deals. But you and I both are passive investors in a lot of different deals. So mm -hmm. we're leads 
lead general partners in some deals, syndicators, but we're also passive investors. And at, at that multifamily meetup, we were having fun talking about one deal that we're both in where we're going to double our money in like three <laughs> years. And like, Woo-hoo! yeah, we're excited uh-huh. about it. Like, so we're, we're not the lead in that deal, but we're, we invested money and we're going to get double our money in three years. So that's, you know, there's benefits to, to all sides. Um, that's another example of tell everybody that you right. know whether you know even whether it's your syndication or not because this is such a great way to build your wealth through this these private syndications where you can actually call your GP call your sponsor and say hey tell me about what's going on at the property you don't get that with buying Tesla or Apple or really great stocks, but you can really have uh, the pulse of your investment right there at your fingertips. Yeah, that's huge that you you get to know the people that are running the deal and Mm -hmm. build that no like and trust factor that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have proximity, you have you have you're very close um, where you don't get that when you're buying a stock. the other thing I think that changes with these private syndications in real estate is that you get both leverage and tax efficiency that you don't get with stocks. You know, so mm-hmm. there's a 70, 75, 80% loan on the on the property. So there's 30, you know, some 20, 30% equity. Well, all the upside, all the profits go to the equity owners. They, it doesn't go to the, the lender. The lender just gets mm-hmm. paid back their loan. And so that makes it very different than if you buy $10,000 with a Tesla. Well, you know, in order for you to double your money, it has to, it has to double in price. But it, mm-hmm. that, that doesn't hap, have to happen in a multifamily deal. You don't have to double the price of the property because the equity component is only a piece of it. It's it's a minority piece of it. So, um, so talk about, have any of your deals gone full cycle? Uh, no, they have not. I, my first deal I got, uh, it'll be four years, uh, this month actually. And, um, we refinanced it in 2019. Okay. Got our investors back 70% of their initial Se- investment. 70%. And we're still, yeah, we're still giving a very, very nice um, distributions even during COVID. It has been uh, my favorite little, <laughs> my favorite little uh, property. Um, but we are considering a sale. We are considering it. So maybe we'll have one uh, at going full cycle down the pike. Fantastic. So, you know, for the listener's benefit, you know, when you go into these deals, they're typically built off of like a five-year business plan. And mm-hmm. depending on the market cycles and, and, and the, you know, the implementation and the execution of the business plan, you know, the property may end up selling early, you know, three years in, four years in. Mm-hmm. Or if the economy is not you know, in a good place, then maybe you have to extend and hold the property six or seven years. Um, But there's really two major exit strategies. And, and you you know, one is to sell the property for a profit and return, you know, the returns to to investors. And the second one is the one you just mentioned, which is, you know, do a cash out refi and keep the property um, for a longer period of time. And so in that case, you know, let's just assume somebody invested $100,000. Well, three years in, they got $70,000 back and mm-hmm. they're still receiving returns, you yes. know, distributions on, and they only have $30,000 still in the deal. And they still own the same percentage of the property. That's correct. That's correct. When we have uh, every intention of keeping that property for a longer hold, that's why we did uh, refinance uh, because this has just been such a great property to manage 
It has had very few problems. It's been cash flowing since day one. Uh, our management team has been great there. So uh, the idea is, is to hold longer. That's fantastic. Um, so you've been in, you've been in the business uh, pro- probably a little bit longer than me. I'm in three and a half years, and you're probably what four and a half, five years. Yes, actually, since 2014. 14. Oh wow! You, so you, mm-hmm. you're in it for seven years. Yes. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So uh, now, what would you tell? younger people or people that are not in real estate now that you know what you know? Get in. (laughs) Get in? (laughs) Yeah, of course. Hey, so look, it sounds simple, but like, that's Mm -hmm. what I say. The people are like, what would you say? I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, start earlier. I'm like, I didn't start till I was 47 and I wish I had started in my twenties, you know? Um, so just get started and you know, get started right. with whatever you can. I mean, if it's a duplex, get a duplex. If it's a fourplex, get yes. a fourplex. And then just so, keep trying to learn from other people. Absolutely. So right now, even with my nieces and nephews, I tell them, you know, instead of buying a house for yourself, buy yourself a duplex and you live in one side, that's a start. Um, just exposing them to the information that I have, it, I think is getting the wheels turning you know, oh, okay, maybe I should invest in some real estate. Yes, that's, yes, that, you should. That's smart. And uh, I heard that on another podcast that what you just uh, recommended to your nephews mm-hmm. that, look, if you have the first time buyer e- exemption one time, you're only a first time buyer once, mm-hmm. and you can get, you know, uh, a three or three and a half percent down payment. Well, instead of buying a single family house for yourself, buy as much as you can a duplex or threeplex or fourplex and you only have to live in it for a year. Mm-hmm. And then after a year, you could move out and then have somebody take over the over the unit you were in. Um, but that's huge because typically, you know, lenders are looking for 20% down. And so, yeah. You know, if you can leverage that on your first transaction and only have to do three, three and a half percent down, that's that's huge. That is really great. And on Warren's side, him being in the military and maybe other military folks can consider what Warren did is he used the VA loans, which is no money down for the most part. Oh, my they, gosh, they have really? a small fee and he would buy houses where he was stationed and then have uh, outside property management take care of the renter that would come in after he left that duty station. So such as the one I mentioned that he had in Port Aransas, when he left that duty station, he rented out that, uh, that home. And he did that again in Virginia. And so we've, we've, he was able to accumulate some homes, single family homes like that. And so for the military folks that have that benefit, uh, especially if you're young and you can stomach it, you know, buy yourself a house and then rent it out when you leave. Right. So then that way, you know, it'll gain in appreciation. And someday if you want to sell it and put it all under one roof into either, let's say, a fourplex, sixplex, eightplex, or into a syndication, something much larger like what we do. That's that's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I wish that I had known about this at a much earlier age so i'm glad that you're you're sharing it with your nephews i'm sharing it with my kids you know we'll see if they actually take action on it um but that's uh how do you build i'm switching gears a little bit but how do you build credibility with the brokers when you're new yes having having an experienced partner is very helpful for sure also when if you are in a mentoring group i think that many of them told me when i first started oh you're in this group well then you have some credibility with me because i know how they teach and what they teach and so that just that there was helpful for me and knowing that um hey so and so told me to talk to you and that so and so is it a credible person so at least that you can show some association 
with somebody that they already know can be very helpful as well. Plus, like asking the right questions. I know that I would ask my mentor, okay, what do I say? What do I say? <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually very helpful because yeah. he would walk me through it. That's smart, though. I mean, you could have just gone and, and winged it, you know, but you may have lost credibility with the broker, but, you know, your experienced partner gave you some good questions to ask and yes and the you know and you were up front with the broker that hey look this is my first property but i'm partnered with somebody who's experienced and i'm part of this mentorship group so we're both part of a group in dallas um that's led by brad sumrock and and i, I had the same experience when i talked to brokers it was like okay one of the first questions they ask is what properties do you own <laughs> well, I don't mm -hmm. I don't really own any yet, but I want to go look at this 100 unit complex and you know, and the broker is probably thinking like, well, this guy's not going to win the you know, the deal. He's wasting my time. But then once you share, "Hey, I'm part of this group." All of a sudden you could hear almost a little bit of a light bulb switch, you know, change mm -hmm. over where the broker's like, "Well, look, you might be new, but you know, I've done a lot of deals with that group and they always you know, new guys always partner with the experienced guys and, and, uh, we haven't had a deal that, you know, hasn't gotten funded that got under contract. And so, exactly. you know, so that brings the credibility piece up, uh, for sure. Um, you know, doing, I think all through this business and maybe you could talk about this is, is doing what you say you're going to do. And that's, all the way through the process, you know, so if you're talking to a partner and you're like, Hey, I'll handle these responsibilities, then do it and do it, yes. do it well, you know? And if you tell the broker, you're going to submit an LOI next week, do it, you know, like, yes. you know, so following through and then when you get under contract, you know, follow through and do what, what you said you're going to do. Mm hmm. Yes. What is the saying? 80% of success in life is just showing up, something along those lines. But yes, it is. It's just showing up. Do what you say you're going to do. It's a miracle how, how that can get you through and get you to success. And some people don't do it. Some people, they say they're going to do something and they, they don't do it. They lose credibility. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, through social media, I've also had people come to me and say, Hey, Darren, I'm, um, you know, I'm looking at these three different mentorship groups, but it's expensive. And I want, you know, if they would guarantee I would get a deal, I would sign up. And I'm like, Oh no. I'm like, don't sign up. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, right. You know, look, people are going to, you know, whether you meet people at, at meetup groups or mentorship groups or you have a mentor or a paid mentor or just a, somebody that's been in the business for a long time, they're going to point the way for you, but they're not going to do the work. No, nobody's going to hand anything to you in anything in life. And so, yeah, that makes me just think of uh, just this journey for myself, uh, even becoming a psychologist. You know, many people would leave in what's called as what's called ABD, all but dissertation, which to me was crazy. They would go through a PhD program, but not write a dissertation, which is very weird. Nobody's going to hand you that piece of science that you have to contribute. You've got to go out and get it. And so then with being in our mentoring group, that person we paid for an education. We paid for an opportunity. Nobody's going to give you the prize. You have to go after it yourself. And that's, that makes the difference between those who succeed and those who only make it halfway. You've yeah. got to really push. I mean, again, that's where it was me coming out to Texas every other month. You got to get your little tush on the plane you got to get your hotel room you got to spend the money you've got to make the time i was working a 40-hour job you know i i was working at the navy clinic for years uh while still coming out here taking my weekends my evenings 
to underwrite, doing all the extra work to make this happen because I really, really believed in it. I, at the time, I was assuming this was just going to cover my retirement. And so that's where I, I often call myself the tortoise rather than the hare. So as you say, yes, I've been doing this for seven years because I thought, oh yeah, it'll, it'll supplement my income later. Uh, but when Warren uh, retired from the Navy, he says, no, let's go full force. Okay, let's go. And so here we are in Dallas, but we had to put in a ton of work. We had to show up. We had to be more than just 80%. That's awesome. Um, look, your story on the ABD, I don't, I, you know, I didn't know about all that, the all but dissertation. Um, that just shows me that you are determined. You are persistent. You have a drive. You believe in yourself. Um, and then the other thing is that you, you know, you made a decision that you were going to do this and you committed to doing it. And I think all of those factors are so critical in somebody that's going to be successful at whatever they do. And, and you obviously, you obviously have it. So I, I applaud you for that. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yes. It's just sticking with it. It's just sticking with it. Never give up. It's not if you want yeah, it bad but, enough. Right. But you have to like, you have to believe in yourself, you know, and you have to make that decision for yourself. You know, you have to be commit, you know, have that commitment, you know, to yourself because nobody's calling you every day and telling you, Hey, you got to underwrite these many deals. You got to, right. you know, set up the appointment for this. You, it's like, you have to have self-determination and yes. Um, so look, you're very nice, sweet. Like when I see you, like you're, but inside you got some drive and determination. <laughs> like, don't mess with me. I'm going to, I'm going to figure this thing out. And, and I love that. That's awesome. Yes. You really hit the nail on the head there, Darren. Yeah. You're, you're right. Yes. Uh, there's, there's a little tigress inside that's <laughs> yeah. going to get it. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's, that's <laughs> huge. That's huge. Hey, talk about, uh, well, you, you, you talked about it a little bit, um, but sacrifices that you had to make. Uh, time was definitely one of them. Um, you know, money, you had to fly mm -hmm. out here. Um, what other type of sacrifices that did you have to go through in order to, you know, through your journey? Well, yeah, I, time and money are, of course, the biggest ones. Um. What about with the, um, so you, you are a husband wife duo. Mm -hmm. Um, you both had separate career paths and now you're coming together to do this multifamily thing together. How, how did that go? Because now all of a sudden you're working together on something that's, you know, look, it's pretty, pretty big financial investment. Um, and you both have different experiences. You, both have different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you guys manage through that process? Okay, that, that question I can answer a little faster. <laughs> All right. Okay, so when we first started, Warren had just taken over a squadron of ships. And so... So how many he, ships is like in a squadron? In his squadron, there were eight. Eight ships. Eight ships. So he's telling those captains what to do. He's really impressive. I, I could go on and on <laughs> about him. Um, but what that meant is that he could not come out to Texas. He could not do this business uh, because you do not leave uh, the area, basically, when you're in command of that kind of stuff. And I know all the military folks out there will understand. So that's where he said, Rebecca, you go. Like, I have a job too. I don't have to answer to anybody on the weekends, but um, that's where I, I kind of took over and came out to Texas a lot. He was my support at that time. He was saying, Re Rebecca, go, you can do this, you can do this. 
uh, you know, spend whatever you want, you know, as far as, let's say, like on a hotels, you, you be as close as you need to be so that you're safe. You do whatever you need. He was always backing me up. Now, us working together, it has been uh, more of the friction, us learning how to work together because it's been separate. So here's a fun uh psychoanalytic sort of analysis what we Uh-oh. have learned <laughs> is that he's much more obsessive and i'm much more compulsive and so what that means is is he obsesses on the details he is my detail guy which is great in many situations me being more compulsive i'm saying oh my gosh you got to get it done come on we got to get it out stop would you stop with the details just get the email out will you <laughs> so I'll say, get it done, get it, get it done. And he says, no, it's got to be perfect. So what we have come to find is that I might be more of the front office, the people uh, part, uh, doing these podcasts, uh, talking to the brokers. I love the underwriting as, as well, where he is the person who, like I said, is, is running the ship. Right. So Warren started out, uh, as a nuclear machinist mate, and then went up to captain, he commissioned and got uh, became an officer. But he knows systems like the boilers, the chillers, the heat, the HVAC. So he really interacts a lot with our maintenance people, and he can really manage people well, which is so great. Being the captain of ships, you've got to manage people. So he is spectacular. At, at that arm of our business. Where, where so he, that's where, where we learn to separate. Where does he use that piece? Uh, so very much so on a balcony that we just had to replace. Uh, the contractor was giving us a rough time. Our regional manager, our maintenance manager, the all three of them were having a tough time together. And so Warren put on his captain's hat and was able to discuss it just like he would discuss with his sailors or maybe with his triad, as many military people would know. That would be the CO, the XO, and your, um, your master chief. So he was able to talk with these men in a way that was respectful but got the job done. That's that's huge. Yeah, I, you mentioned the the thing the areas where I thought that he, that would come into play is one, you know, um, working with the property management company. You know, at times they're doing fantastic. At times there's some challenges, and you you know you want to be respectful, and they're trying to do their their job, but you also want to. You know, you're, you're in the ownership group and you have responsibilities and it's back to investors. And so you, mm-hmm. you want to figure out a way to communicate together. So you're both, you know, charging down the same road. And and I would imagine that for him, you know, that comes like second nature. You know, he. Yes, it does. So that, yes. that's a that's a great quality. Another thing to say about that is that, you know, you and your husband learned how to leverage each other's strengths, you know? And then you also do the same thing when you partner with somebody that has experience. They may have certain strengths and and even after you do a deal or two or three, you still partner with people and it's nice when you have complementary, you know, strengths so that one person handles one area, another person can handle another area and you feel confident, look, this other person like Warren's going to you know, manage these people a lot better than I will. But, you know, I'm going to be out in front of the investors. I'm going to be going to all the investor meetings. And and so that's a great approach. I love what you guys did there. Um, you know, look, a husband and wife having two different careers coming together, it could have been some friction that, you know, was unresolved. There could, have been, there could be, you know some ego that gets in in the way and definitely um so i love your response to that that's that's awesome hey um what is the next big stretch goal for you rebecca Ooh, the stretch goal
Uh oh, she doesn't know if she wants to say it. She has it in her mind, but she doesn't. She doesn't know if she wants to be accountable to it. Oh my goodness! Um, I, I I think it's uh, multifold uh, to get uh, bigger and better properties. Of course, uh, more more doors and uh, B classes. For sure. But I think a stretch goal, when I think of stretching, I think of, of course, my mindset. Because that is where we really grow. Right. And so um, promotion, doing what we're doing right now, uh, getting our name out there, telling the people that I wish I would have told before, as I said, helping others to be able to um, invest like we have been able to, just like you mentioned, the, the deal that we're both in, that we're going to make great returns. What a blessing. Right. What a blessing. And I want other people to have that same experience. So um, marketing myself, which my humble self, I, I'm not, it, this is not, uh, this doesn't come as first nature, let's say, but or second nature. <laughs> Look, <laughs> but, it's, un- it's uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. And and I, what I can tell you, look, I have a podcast and I'm on social media. Mm-hmm. What I can tell you is that it gets easier as you see the benefits of helping other people that you wouldn't have helped had yeah. you not done it. So I was not on social media until I joined the mentorship group. I wasn't on Facebook. Mm-hmm. I wasn't on anything. And then after like a certain period of time I was going to these entrepreneurial conferences and they're like, you got to get on Instagram. And I'm like, Instagram. Oh man. Like really? And just like you, it's uncomfortable. Like I'm going to post stuff and like, Oh, you know, what am I going to do? But then when all of a sudden somebody contacts you from Vegas or Chicago or Ohio that you would never have talked to before, and you share your experience and you can tell that you know it's provided some inspiration to them well that's that's what we're all here for man is to help other yes. people you know so look for you guys look i like that you were candid about that and i think that 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 is a it's another fear you know and and it never ends so you know you you learned how to syndicate and then it's like, what's next? And then you got to do something and you got to get yourself uncomfortable again. It's like, uh-huh. you kind of want to say, I crossed, I crossed the finish line. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to do it anymore. But like it, you know what? That's, that's when you, you're living and you, you, you know, when you're enjoying the journey and you don't really know how to do everything, but you're learning along the way and you're pushing yourself. So constantly growing. Yes. So I applaud you for that. And, and um, look, that's not, not not a lot of people. Most people, when I ask that question, talk about number of doors and number of assets under management and stuff. And, and um, But that's a very real issue for people. One is raising capital, like, oh, I have to ask people for money. And two is social media. Look, I was afraid to hit post. How silly is that? You know, no, I don't see think it's silly at all. It, but it is. I agree. At the end of the day, but like I was like, oh my gosh, what are people gonna think? And mm-hmm. now I'm like, whatever. Like some people are gonna like it, and some people aren't. And I'm gonna help some people, and some people are gonna go looking somewhere else. And mm-hmm. you know, you you once you get over that, um, it changes. So I I like that you shared that. So thank you very much. Um, What do you like to do outside of work? Outside Uh, of real estate? What? Golf? Oh, family. Family family. is what I like to do outside of work. My family, we get together and do a lot of fun things. Um, Like what? Oh, like what we went to Zion not too long ago, did hiking. Zion National Park? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, My sister has a boat, so we do a lot of boating. When you so when you went to Zion, did you stay in a hotel or like? Yeah, did we did. Whole, okay. And oh uh, yeah, I I, you're I not don't the RV camp. person. You don't have the camper. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I would RV in an RV, but not in a tent. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> 
so family's big for you. Is your family all in California, and and how did they like the, you know, you move into Texas? They want to move to Texas too, which is Re- so funny. My sister does. My sister does. I have a brother up in San Francisco area too, uh, but yes, I love to get back there as well. Um, other things that we like to do, yeah, definitely boating. We have family up in Kentucky as well, uh, and they. They also have a boat, so I guess it's all boating, isn't it? Well, <laughs> a lot of water. Outdoor stuff, so that's that's mm-hmm. good. Hey, um, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to to find out more about you and, and reach out? Great. Well, our new website at www.starboardequity.com. Uh, you can check us out there and get onto our uh, Starboard Equity Club, as well as my personal address is Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, at starboardequity.com. Love to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, Rebecca, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, You had really a lot of great insight. And um, listeners, I hope you enjoyed that one. Until next week, signing off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com learn. 